warm welcome to everyone to this week's soundbite. My name is Dr. Oni Idoko, and I am co-program leader for the MSc in Prosperity, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship. Today, we then have with us Zubai Jun Jr. Um, he is an educational activist, a social entrepreneur, and founder of Z Notes. A global student movement he started at the age of 16 and today has reached over 3.8 million students from all over the world. He is the recipient of the Diana Legacy Award, the highest accolade a young person can receive for their social and humanitarian efforts. Zubair is the national youth leader for the UK at the Global Partnership for Education. He's also an advisory board member of DeFi at Cambridge University and the EY Foundation, as well as the One Young World Ambassador. He's an SDG advocate. He has been published and spoken internationally, including at the 74th UN General Assembly, the ITU Regional Innovation Forum, and he has um, spoken at TEDx. Zubair was the first ever youth moderator at the UN ECOSOC Youth Forum and has delivered workshops on social entrepreneurship at universities, including King's College London and the University of Cambridge. He holds a master's degree in mathematics from UCL, and he is a marathon runner, triathlete, and inline figure skater. We're fortunate to have Zubair with us, and without further ado, I will now hand over to him. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, the last time I was in the IOE, it was because of lectures. So uh, I was a student here. I studied mathematics, and we used to have some of the lectures around the corner in Logan Hall and a couple other places. Um, it's good to be back, and also a, a very lovely surprise to wake up in the morning to find out that you're speaking to. 200 odd people, it doesn't look like 200, but yeah, quite a few people. Uh, my name is Zubair, I am really grateful for the kind introduction. Um, and I would like to share my journey of social entrepreneurship, uh, what Zenotes does, and also to kind of extend into the philosophical ideologies with which I believe how social impact and social entrepreneurship should happen, uh, particularly uh, grassroots and community-led uh, solutions when it comes to uh, solving social problems, and also considering how problem owners, people who are in crises, who are in uh, deep social inequalities, can become problem owners uh, and they can start solving those problems themselves. Um, so let me share my story. Uh, it's not going to be very long. Uh, it's not incredibly well prepared, forgive me. This is all the slides I could pull together in the tube right from, uh, from Stratford. Uh, and uh, after this, kind of my first few minutes of conversation, I'd love to kind of extend into your ideas and your questions not just questions for me, but also thoughts that you have based on what, I, what I'll share with you today. So um, as Anya kindly said, you know, Zenos is a global student movement that's fighting education inequality. And the, the journey began really when, I, when you think about this, right, there's the 100 meter um, start line uh, at the London 2012 Olympics, and you look at everyone starting at the same position. Um, that is not the case when it comes to education. Many other social problems as well, but that was what I first saw, and it's, because of multiple issues, we have inequalities in how um, standardized testing especially is, uh, is an uneven playing field, whether that is the differences in, in teaching quality right at the source. Um, it's the, the fact that certain educational resources are so incredibly expensive and inaccessible to so many. And then finally, when you need additional support like tutoring or whatever that is, um, that is a huge financial burden that so many cannot, um, cannot perform and achieve. So. Uh, this is me a couple years uh, ago. I was 16. I just finished my GCSE exams, and I was uh, looking around and saw this really, really viscerally. I was uh, born and raised in Saudi Arabia as an expatriate, so I had uh, all around me different, uh, different low-income schools that I could see that couldn't even afford relevant textbooks. I looked back home in Pakistan, and I saw that many of my uh, peers, family members, were not able to receive the same level of support. Uh, so at, the, at that age, I did what I could do. I was, I was a uh, messing around with computers and websites at the time. So I, I set up this tiny little blog called Zenotes and I started to share educational resources. So these were revision notes that I'd written for my own exam preparation. 
I put them on a blog. It was a it was not Xenos.org at the time. It was an incredibly long WordPress.com domain, um, and I let it out. I pu I put it out there in the world, and then something strange happened. Uh, this is all accidental, as you will see, uh, as with the fact that I'm speaking to you here today. Very accidental. Um, the journey of my of social entrepreneurship and specifically entrepreneurship is uh, is one that has kind of something I've fallen into rather than kind of gone out to choose to do. Um, the first thing that changes in my journey is, is this. Uh, I get an email from, uh, from someone based in India. His name is Abhijit. He says, Zubair, I've been benefiting from your resources. It's been incredibly helpful. But uh, obviously, you do seven or eight GCSEs, a couple of A-levels. Uh, you're not covering all the subjects. And I would love to help contribute to create more resources that can start to cater for those subjects as well. Um, and that was the first of many. Uh, after that, hundreds have joined this global movement from all over the world, contributing resources, uh, creating content, whether that's revision notes, whether that's video content, and they're collectivizing and making it available through our global learning platform. Um, and this is what is transformed into that little blog is now a, a community-led learning platform that is, uh, has 100, over 100 sets of resources, supporting seven international exam boards, um, and it's, um, it's been reached by millions of students. But the, the special thing about what Xenos started to do was that notes and content was, was one part of the solution. What was really, really valuable was the fact that students from all over the world were discovering that there were others like them who were doing the same subject and faced challenges, but were able to relate much better than even teachers could do sometimes. So we started in different form, but now what we've turned it into is we're leveraging a platform called Discord, which some of you might know of, uh, which we've kind of like hacked together to make it more of a learning environment where students are both engaging synchronously and asynchronously uh, in achieving their academic outcomes, but not just the academic outcomes, but also their social outcomes. So within this community, especially because of the type of generation we're dealing with, we're all anonymized behind Discord user tags and weird profile pictures. Uh, they are comfortable sharing and learning from each other without actually sharing exactly what their background is. So you might not know that one of the students is their first time to go to university in their family. That you might not know that this person comes from a very privileged background. And yet when they're in a community, when they're working against the same challenge, which is the standardized test, they want to support each other in any way. And they're sharing advice, both for their academic outcomes, but also things like, how do I get into universities? How do I get into internships? Those information, that social capital, which resided only in a very selective group of people for so long, has now been democratized by this anonymized community solution. To dive a little bit deeper into the kind of the, the approach we take is it's not just uh, crowdsourced. Uh, there's a lot of challenges with that. So we spend a lot of time developing a very robust model where we get students to apply and share their uh, academic credentials, about what they're achieving, where they're going. Um, and then once we select them, we then interview them, we work with them and train them into learning the skills to develop the content in the quality that we, as, uh, we want it to be. Uh, we then have a moderation process which reviews the content and then we finally have a wiki-like functionality on our platform which allows students to continuously uh, provide suggestions and corrections to the, to the notes themselves as well. Um, and this is just through word of mouth. Um, organically we've been able to have over 28 million hits on the platform, almost 4 million students and educators reached. Um, in the last 12 months, um, that statistic is a little out of date. We have had almost 1.4 million unique visitors. Uh, many of these students are coming from Global South countries, especially those which have a higher influence of British education. Um, and uh, it's, it's all been organic. It's all been the fact that students learn and share and then share it with other, other friends as well. Um, the results are uh, Astounding. Uh, students tend to uh, share how their, their, the effect of the notes on their learning, both through testimonials like, like Ahid who says he was able to get to his university of choice, um, or some of our interns. So the, the way this organization is structured is that students are voluntarily creating content, also engaging in internship programs. And these interns uh, have a team of about 35 people right now. They're based all over the world in learning skills of being part of a global s social impact startup developing those employability skills and feeling that they're part of a meaningful change. Um, there's some statistics at the bottom that I might like to highlight as something important when it comes to social entrepreneurship. And one of them is social return on investment. Um, have you guys heard of this term before, SROI? No? Um, it's a, 
it's not the best metric, and most metrics aren't. Uh, you have to take it with a pinch of salt. But it's a nice one to very quickly try to explain how a social impact startup or initiative is creating impact. So what it does is it collectivizes all the inputs that are going into a certain set of interventions or works. Uh, it looks at the monetary cost of those. Even if it's volunteer efforts, it kind of gives an aggregate kind of monetary value to that. It then looks at the impact that you're creating. It uses benchmarks across different organizations, different other initiatives, the costs that are associated to delivering those services, um, and then it compares the two. So our ratio is 1 to 28, which means for every dollar invested in what Xenos does, we're producing $28 worth of impact. Um, this was work carried out by an external organization, an organization called One Young World. Um, so we're incredibly proud of that sort of number because it really attests to the impact that we wish to see and create. Um, the UNSCG4 logo is also there, and I'll dive a little bit deeper as we, as we go through the slides, as how the Sustainable Development Goals provide a framework for addressing inequalities and also measuring your outcomes across a global scale. Um, the interesting thing was that not only were students using this platform, but we were also getting thousands of teachers who were using and recommending the platform, both teachers who were able to prepare for lessons, especially during the pandemic when we had such varied um, support systems available at, at different schools. So some schools were able to you know, go online without, a, without any challenges. Their students did have access to um, you know, digital tools or devices that allowed them to take those lessons. And even here in the UK, we saw inequalities within London as bad as where students had to take lessons in bathtubs because that was the only quiet space that existed in the whole room, in the whole house. Um, so you can't even imagine what inequalities existed in, in the global south. Um, but teachers were benefiting from the platform and even to the extent that they were able to cut costs and replace the usage of textbooks because our notes were able to uh, provide that learning support. My philosophy within Zenotes and within EdTech more broadly is this that we, I believe in the transition from the role of students simply as consumers of education to becoming the creators and proponents of it. Um, I think that's where the revolution of education will happen, that we change that role, that we empower young people and students, that relatability factor is incredibly important. And I also believe that this is a solution to go from what we've been able to do in a very bootstrap way of, to reach millions of students to tens and hundreds, a capitally less inducive uh, approach to ensuring that every young person, every student has access to the support and resources that allow them to do their very best in academic initiatives. Um, this is kind of something that you might have come across as in, through social entrepreneurship. Has anyone heard about theories of change? So it is the articulation of any and all interventions that your organization does uh, and trying to measure it across short-term, medium-term, long-term outcomes. So uh, the way that is a very kind of short summary of it, and I'll, I'd love to tell you a little bit more about how, our, how we've kind of come across our theory of change. It's been a very long introspective activity. Um, but the idea is that you become very uh, introspective. You look at your organization, what type of initiatives are running, and then you go in and you start to figure out what are the assumptions associated to that. Why are you doing this? Who are the audiences and people that you can affect because of the, the way you've taken an approach? Um, and then you look at the different levels of outcomes. So there are measurable outputs that you can see. These are the most immediate things you can see, whether that is a, a metric a traction number, whether that is a, a feedback survey. It's, it's something that's tangible and can be quantified, either qualitative or quantitative. Um, the second part is then the medium and long-term outcomes. So medium term tend to be uh, le less easy to measure, um, and this is kind of where uh, impact measurement is such a contentious topic right now as well about how do we actually go about it. Um, medium term impact are slightly harder but then long terms are the, are the most difficult because it often requires longitudinal studies to be looking at uh, time scales of you know, three, five, ten years, maybe sometimes even longer to really see whether the, the things that you wish to impact actually have happened. So some of the things that we've talked about like you know, increased global citizenship or an interest in pursuing community service activities some of those things are tangible. So we see some of our team members uh, do an internship with us and then go on and set up their own NGOs because they've seen the, the way an organization structures, uh, how a, a student movement comes together, and they want to take that skill set that they've developed and then run it and uh, approach other social problems themselves. But it, it's also really difficult because it might not result in a year's time. It might happen five, ten years' time down the line. Um, the most right-hand most column is the UN SDGs, and this is something that we're, uh, we've ensured that the outcomes we wish to see are aligned with those you know, high-level targets that the UN has set out. Um, 
Some of you may know of the 17 goals which are set out. Um, they're very high level. They, for example, goal number four says that we want to have inclusive and equitable quality education for all. But that is very, very broad. Uh, what the UN has also done, and oftentimes not looked into too deeply, is set out measurable sub-goals. And those sub-goals are, are illustrated there because we cannot, um, within the goal four, we have a target like ensuring basic literacy or improving access for, uh, for, for those who were unable to gain education at their early ages, but they are now wanting to uh, you know, go back into school at the at, you know, mothers or, or people who are unable to do so at an early age. So these are issues we're not directly tackling. And so we need to be very clear about what are the targets that we can work towards. And that's why it's been very, we've gone very granular into what interventions that we do, how does that link with the higher targets that an or as a global uh, society we're looking to achieve, and which ones do we fit in most best. Um, this is the summary, as I said, uh, our theory of change is like 30 odd pages long and we've tried to link every outcome and intervention and out assumption with academic literature to discuss and describe why we think the approach we've taken is the right thing to do. Um, so I think this is my final slide and I hope to kind of unpack, this has kind of been quite a short discussion but I'd like to kind of hear from you as well. Um, for me, social impact and entrepreneurship is, is is this kind of concept of ripples. It's not a uh, single thing that you do. It has, you know, these waves that go on to affect, you know, people within that the person that you affected, but also those around them. Um, and I always like to think of impact in that holistic way, which also means that that ripple could be positive or negative. And I think sometimes we're not as, um, rigorous with ourselves to think about the negative impact because it's it's as much as we're doing certain things which we think are working well we're not we may not be considering the negative impacts that could happen as well so um, that is scary because as a ripple if it's a negative impact that can go on to reach lots and lots of people as well so um, I hope that's shared a little bit about my journey um, I landed in this accidentally I've then taken on different advocacy roles as well as an activist um, and my, my whole thesis is around, uh, or my personal motto is around impacting as many people as possible in my existence on this planet. And um, at this point of time, the vehicle that I've chosen is entrepreneurship because I can see that that's creating impact and I'm, I want to take that further. Um, so this is where we are at. We envision now going on to impact hundreds of millions in our student-empowered approach to leveling the playing field. Uh, thank you so much for listening and I'd love to unpack and open questions to you. Thank you, Zubair, for that wonderful presentation. Um, so I'll start us off with one or two questions, if that's OK. I'm really interested in, so you started off talking about problem owners sort of taking on the role of problem solvers rather than being like a top-down approach. So I'm wondering, could you talk a little bit more about that approach? and? how could that be applied in other settings? So can we learn, can we take that methodology or that approach that you're using within your um, enterprise yeah. and apply that in perhaps dealing with um, inequalities apart from within the setting, the context of education, maybe inequalities that might have to do with gender or, or some other challenge that we're faced with now? Sure. Um, so a lot of what I've described today has not been something I set out to do. Uh, it's very much emergent and the different programs that we run now, the interventions that are set up, the way we approach different processes are all uh, linked to use cases which have emerged within the community. So we ha I talked about our Discord community. We have about 15,000 members there. They're our greatest champions. They'll shout at about us from the top of the roof, but they're also our greatest critiques. They'll tell us when they don't like something. Um, and by being so closely knit with the people who are facing the problems has ensured that we always are working in developing solutions that are aligned to their, their niche and their, their specific niche needs. Um, I was someone who faced that problem of inequality and maybe not as viscerally and as, as realistically as those in different circumstances, but seeing and feeling that and then taking my initiative and, and taking those uh, you know, lived experiences to then build a solution resulted in a very different approach than, let's say, 
uh, a Ministry of Education comes up with an idea to solve this problem. So I think um, the way Xenotes is structured and it's emerged is, is through a grassroots movement and I think that's an incredibly powerful way, especially when we're looking at localized challenges. Um, we, we say, you talked about gender inequality. Gender inequality is, is a huge challenge. It's part of the SDGs, but also it's incredibly nuanced. It has a very, very different meaning when, it, when we talk about certain geographies, when we talk about the subcontinent versus sub-Saharan Africa versus, you know, places like the UK where we're talking about the same overall challenge but the, the differences are minute and if we don't approach it in that sensitive way, uh, we can often cause uh, greater challenges. Um, so my thesis and I, 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 the way I, I, I see social entrepreneurship being most impactful is when those people who face the problem can actually be equipped with the tools and the resources and support to allow them to solve the problem. Um, those with lived experiences or uh, you know, very, very close to if it's a degree away, uh, if they can be given the support system to then develop the solutions, that can be incredibly impactful. Um, on a broader kind of um, perspective, entrepreneurship and especially what we're, what we're seeing with startups in the global south um, are lots of copycat uh, startups. We're seeing Uber set up in, the, in this part of the world and then we see other cap services being set up in parts of and other parts of the countries, right? So we see in Pakistan, or we see in in Nigeria, or we see in uh, in India that these are like other initiatives which are kind of copying that same model. Um, I think that's uh, it's a little bit of a challenge. We we, we can't really um, localize these solutions directly, and we want to. And oftentimes, it's these large venture capitalists who think, oh, there's a market there. We can just you know, exploit it and develop the solution and start to get as much revenue and then uh, jump ship and IPO or, you know, take our shares away and, and jump out of it. Um, that's, that's where I f I'm a little bit scared about how entrepreneurship can go as well, and we're seeing the challenges there. Um, but if we really are clear about the mission that we want to solve and we give those people who have the problems with the resources that they need, uh, we are seeing, and uh, oftentimes, and this is kind of the bias as a, as a young social entrepreneur and spending most of my time with young social activists and entrepreneurs, uh, I see that they're much more, you know, have that bootstrap mentality. They get on the ground, they start doing something. Um, some of my peers and some of, my, uh, some of the people I find most inspiring are impacting people immediately by developing and running initiatives uh, on the ground and are able to address those specific needs um, because they are, you know, so, so close to the problem. Um, so I think, uh, I think like at a policy level and governmental level, we need to start to see how we can fund those sort of initiatives. And from a societal level, we need to identify those young people or those, I uh, shouldn't be biased, I shouldn't be ageist. For anyone who's developing such solutions, um, we need to empower them so that, and then and vocalize and amplify them so that their solutions do rise to the top and we don't select those which are VC cases and most backable in terms of a venture capital, capitalist met methodology. Uh, to actually develop solutions that can address social problems. Thank you for that. And it, it sort of aligns with the conversation that we've been having in class around rethinking innovation um, and what we would define as innovation. Comp you know, when you look at the global north versus the global south, what would be classed as innovation and worth investing in um, there's a particular definition that has a hegemonic um, position in society. So if it's not high tech and it can't scale incredibly fast, then the chances of getting funding are quite slim. I have one more question before I open up to everyone else to ask their questions. So you talked about, you talked about how you ended your talk with the ripple actually, yeah. which I thought was interesting. And you said, it could go, it could either be positive or it could be negative in terms of the kind of um, consequences or if you like, even externalities that you can cause from the enterprise that you start. So I'm wondering what are some of the mechanisms that Zenodes has in place that allows you to sort of sidestep or, 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 or guard against these negative consequences that could potentially happen? It's a great question and I don't have a great answer because it's something um, you can never really completely guard against and we're still at a very early stage 
Um, we've never received funding. We've bootstrapped it. We're volunteer-led, and everything that we do is uh, has to be, you know, thought very deeply about the resources that we have, which is incredibly thin. Um, some of the ways that we are we're trying to address this is is actually just being receptive. Um, as entrepreneurs, you can get a big ego, or as as you know, when you develop a solution that's starting to reach people, you start to think that that's the best way to approach it. Um, throughout the organization's history, we've been incredibly open to critique, and that has meant that we have heard if there were challenges kind of being felt, we were we were the first to hear about it, whether that was through a Discord DM or whether that was through an email or whether that was through uh, a comment on YouTube, whatever that was, we were there to listen to it and, and kind of address it. Um, I also uh, ensure this kind of the safeguarding by having very, very smart people around me. So I, uh, I ha have a very strong advisory board uh, of people coming from incredible backgrounds in social entrepreneurship, from places like Ashoka, from places like, uh, you know, uh, faculties of education in Cambridge. So these are people who have been incredibly experienced and so I'm able to soundboard and ensure that what we're doing is aligning to kind of at least um, cutting edge research and, and kind, of kind of approaches that are being taken at, at larger scales as well. So um, I think we don't have uh, as strong and robust of a system as we'd wish to want, um, but at least we're trying to ensure by being receptive both to our end users and also to those who may have the knowledge and experiences beyond our kind of scale to be able to uh, kind of impart their advice and, and support as well.